is to be of, I don't know, bigger importance to symplectic geometries, but I will try to motivate this from a perspective of algebraic geometry and mirror symmetry as well. So yeah, so that's the title. It's about constructing a pietic version of Fukai category and a pietic analytic action on this folk and you know, deducing information of deducing information about the growth of fuller homology groups. The terms will be introduced. So this is the overview. I will start with some motivation from algebraic geometry and mirror symmetry, and I will tell the basics of fuller homology and Fukai categories. Um, and we'll say the main result. The main result depends on the notion of fuller homology. So, and then I will speak a little about the main tool, namely the, the pietic analytic action. And then I will sketch the proof of the theorem if I make it there. Okay. So here's the motivation. So this is a theorem of Jason Bell from 2005, and it's called Generalized Skolem mahler leh Theorem. If you have a complex affine variety and a automorphism of this variety, and if you have a sub-variety of X called Y and a point outside or inside Y, then you can look at the orbit of the point under the automorphism and the set of natural numbers where the k iterate of phi K, so the phi to the kx is in y is a union of finite linear arithmetic progressions and finite linear other numbers. So this is a nice subset of natural numbers. Not very complicated. And he actually has some versions for coherent shifts as well. He, not only he, a couple of other people as well. And he describes similar results for the set of natural numbers where tor of f phi to the k star f prime is non-zero. And this is built for surfaces. It's also, there are, there are some, it's a little bit informal, but yeah, it's just the motivation here. And so one can ask if there are symplectic analogs of this theorem. So this is a Paul Seidel conjectured this. If you have, two Lagrangians, two nice half-dimensional sub-manifolds of a symplectic manifold M and a symplectomorphism phi on M, then the set of natural numbers where phi to the K L is isomorphic in some sense to L prime is a union of finitely many arithmetic progressions and finitely many other numbers. I don't think he actually expected this to be true in the whole generality. But I mean, that's somehow, you know, he wondered about in what cases there can be, in what cases, well, I, I'm, not, I'm not going to complete the sentence, sorry. And for the heuristic relation to the theorem that I stated in the previous slide, you can consider X to be a moduli of Lagrangians, which is not something very well defined, but anyway, and you can take the point in the, a fine variety to be one of the Lagrangians. And you can take the sub variety to be the singleton consisting of the other Lagrangian. And if you know the Bell's theorem, if you know Bell's theorem holds in this case, then you would deduce the conjecture of Seidel. Of course, you don't really expect anything in this generality at all, but that's the motivation. Okay. And so, to explain the result, I need to introduce the basics of floor homology and Fukai categories. So throughout the talk, lambda will denote the Novikov field. It's the field, so, sorry, it's the field of series with coefficients in Q and for, let's see. Yeah, it's, it's like a field of, it's a field of Lorentz series basically, but you allow real exponents as well. And, if you have a symplectic manifold, such as an oriented surface, you know, with a fixed area form, and if you have two Lagrangians, such as, you know, like just two simple closed curves that doesn't bound the disk and that are non-separating, well, okay. Then you also assume L and L, sorry, I'm, yeah, 
LNL primer, inter, inter, so you also assume LNL prime intersect transversely. This assumption ensures that L intersection L prime is actually finite. Then you define the Fuller chain group as the complex CF LL prime is the span of L intersection L prime over your base field. Okay, so this is a finite dimensional vector space over lambda. And you define its differential by counting two gons. Okay, so to define the differential, you have to pick two intersection points and specify the coefficient of y inside d of x. So d of x is a linear combination of intersection points. And the coefficient is given by co counting two gons, holomorphic two gons that go from x to y and they have boundary on L and L prime. And you do weight them by this term here. E to the EU refers to the area of the two gon, and T is the formal parameter that appear in the Novikov field. Okay. Any questions so far? No? It seems no. Okay. And you can actually define a product involving the Fuller homology groups. So just a notation I denote by HF LL prime. Sorry, I denote the cohomology of this guy by HF LL prime and I define a product structure by counting triangles. So I define the product of intersection point. So I define the coefficient of Z in the intersect in the product of intersection points X and Y to be the sum that you see on the slide here on the bo on board. So I count triangles with corners on X, Y, and Z. The boundaries are on the Lagrangians, L0, L1, and L2 that appear here. And I weight them similarly by T to the energy, so T to the area here. This is again the simply, this is again the area of the triangle here, and T is the formal parameter. And this product is not associative, but it's associative in cohomology and it's also associative up to homotopy. And there are you know, homotopies of homotopies, etc. You can define some more general products, higher products, and they build up to something called an A-infinity structure. But for this talk, I will just ignore this. But you know, you can make the Lagrangians into a category in this way. So you define the Fukai category. I'm being a little sloppy here, but I denote it by Fm lambda. Lambda is the coefficient field. Its objects are Lagrangians and the home sets from L to L prime are given by the Fuller chain groups, span of intersection points of L and L prime. Okay, and the product is as before. And I'm being a little sloppy here. I'm not telling you how to define home LL, but. Okay, and this thing may be a bit hard to compute. But in some cases, it's equivalent to, in some sense, equivalent to coherent sheaves on, on another variety that I denote by M check. It's the dual variety, it's the mirror dual variety. So, some examples. If you have, for instance, C star, the left hand side here is a, is a symplectic cylinder, then its mirror is GM. Well, you can also think of it as a cylinder as well. And the circles here correspond to skyscraper sheaves on the right side. And a similar example. Again, this is a cylinder, but I remove two open disks from two ends. So this is, you know, this is an infinite cylinder, and I remove this two half open disks or whatever you want to call two half planes from two sides. And this is mirror to P1. And again, the point, the circles here correspond to skyscraper sheaves, except you have to ign ignore zero and infinity. So this was just the motivation, but if you have an automorphism of P1, well, that fixed zero and infinity, and let's assume it's you know acting by a you know, it's just acting as multiplication by a positive real number. 
Then the rank of the X groups that you see here, X to F, F upper star to the N, F prime is actually constant in N with finitely many possible exceptions. Okay, you, I'm being, yeah. It's almost a trivial statement. Questions? Okay. Yeah, just stop me if you have any questions. So mirror symmetry was just for motivation. And here's the main result. I should say the examples I gave do not fall into the examples covered in the paper that I recently put on archive. So if you have a symplectic manifold that satisfies a condition called monotonicity, now exam I will give you examples. You can think of higher genus surfaces. And if you have a symplectomorphism, isotopic to identity, then for any two Lagrangians, not any, but for any nice Lagrangians, L and L prime, the rank of Floer homology, HF L phi to the K L prime is constant in K with finitely many exceptions, finitely many possible exceptions. So there are some assumptions, the assumptions that uh, M has to satisfy. I'm you know, stating them out of honesty. I could have just ignored them as well, but the Fukai category here has to be finitely generated. It basically means that this, this condition basically means that you can actually see this category as a category of proper modules, finite rank modules over some algebra over some ordinary algebra. And there's a finite set of generators that satisfy a condition called bohr sommerfeld condition. I will explain the important implication of the second condition here. Questions? Okay. Yeah, I hope I'm not going too fast or Okay, so this condition, the second condition I stated implies that the sums defining the coefficients of the differential and the product on the Fuller chain groups are actually finite. So if you remember, we had expressions like this. By the way, do you see my cursor? Yes. yes okay. Yes, okay. Uh, maybe I should actually use this. So we had this type of sums, and I never told them that I never told that they were actually finite. This is the reason you are using the Novikov field. But the bar sommerfeld condition implies that this is actually a finite sum. And if you have a set of generators, then as I said, you can see the Foucault category as well. A category of modules over an algebra. This is called total algebra. You can do this with any category, but you know, if there are too many objects, it's not going to be unital. So this is just a finite set here. So it's the sum of all home home sets of objects. And every Lagrangian also define an object of the Foucault category, and I can see them as a right module or a left module. I denote the right module by H sub L, and it's the sum that you see here. It's the sum over J of CF, L, J, L, and you can also define a left module, H, you know, H sub L, H upper L, it's this direct sum. I hope I haven't lost any, any everyone so far. Okay. Yeah, let me let's try to. Okay. Questions so far? This is something very general. It doesn't have to involve anything about square categories. Those CFs are just home sets here. And you can actually recover the homes from L to L prime as the homes of the corresponding modules. And you can also write this as the tensor product that you see here. So this is the tensor product of this right module with this left module over your algebra. Questions? There's a nice picture, maybe everyone will be happier with this. 
Okay. Yes, sir. So, you know, there were too many terms, maybe too many yeah, new concepts, but the easiest example I can give is a genus two surface. Okay. It's quite a category. It's generated by the four curves that you see here, the colored curves, L1, L2, L3, and L4. And you can assume they're bohr sommerfeld monotone. They satisfy the technical conditions. And you can let L and L prime to be any pair of non-separating curves. And you can even take them multi-curves. And then maybe I should have stated, yeah. Then they will satisfy the theorem. Then, you know, HF L and phi to the K L prime for any phi isotopic to identity will be constant with finite many possible exceptions. So, so the main tool, so any questions so far? Because I think these are important. Otherwise, you may be bored for the rest. Uh, maybe a question, do the exceptions actually happen? What's that? Uh, yes, 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 it happens. I mean, in this example, if you use multi-curve, mm -hmm multi-curves, you can get any intersection patterns. If you use connected curves, I don't think you can actually get a set of exceptions that are larger than, you know, that's larger than a singleton. But you can, you know, produce examples like sigma two cross sigma two, like higher dimensional ex examples where there are more interesting intersection, uh, you know, exception patterns or whatever. Mm -hmm. But yes, like uh, maybe I should actually, you know, there's a, there's a disadvantage of not being able to use the, yeah, unfortunately, I won't be able to redact on the PDF here. So let me try to new share, whiteboard, share. Okay, sorry. And for instance, if you have, sorry. So you can ignore the previous curves there, but if you have, for instance, something like this here and some other curve here, you can always create a symplectic isotopy that moves this curve, right? And it will intersect, so not intersect, so it will flow theoretically intersect this guy only at one point. So when you consider the symplectic isotopy, it will be, you know, the flow homology groups by to the F L here, I'm saying something more general than I proved, but anyway, it's go going to be zero for all but one T. Yeah, that's what I meant. And you can produce, you know, more interesting patterns by just considering multi-curves here. Let's say, for instance, this is the second Lagrangian. And then you can also produce connected examples where more interesting sets of exceptions happen in higher dimensions. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay, so. Sorry, what? Do you see the slides again? No, it, uh, yeah, I don't see. Uh, okay. I'm going to I'm going to close the whiteboard then. I think that should be. I'm sorry. Sure. Uh -huh. We are back. You see it now, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the main tool here is, you know, what was on the title, constructing periodic analytic actions. Bell proves the theorem by interpolating the orbit by a periodic analytic arc. We will interpolate the iterates of phi by a periodic analytic action. Okay. So unfortunately, I have to introduce more algebra here, but you know, um, this is not a, okay. So if you have a 
simplectomorphism, that's isotopic to identity. I did not set by simp not, but I think this notation will not appear again. Then you can produce an auto-equivalence of the Fukaya category. It's technical, but you can do this. It's intuitive also, right? You just mapped every Lagrangian to its image under phi. And you can also produce, for any auto-equivalence, you can produce a bimodule that, that I define in this way. If you, that you have no phi, you remember there was this algebra that was more the equivalent to Fukaya category. And you can imagine how to use the Fluer product to give a bimodule structure to the expression here. For instance, if you have identity, you have identity auto equivalence and you have the diagonal bimodule. And if you have composite, sorry, composition turns into tensor product of bimodules. Everything here is derived, but I'm ignoring such technical difficulties. And since phi is actually isotopic to identity, this suggests to define the local action as a deformation of the diagonal bimodule. Right? Because you know, diagonal is what corresponds to identity here. So okay, I reminding you of something, but if you haven't seen it, you can take it as a black box. For a symplectic manifold, you can produce symplectic isotopies by just choosing a closed bound form. I didn't write the formulas because I don't think it's going to be helpful. But you can assume, you know, without loss of generality, we can assume the symplectomorphism we start with is the time bound flow of a symplectic isotopy. And so let me define the family of bimodules corresponding to time t action of this isotopy. So I define the family, as, sorry, I define you know, the underlying graded vector space to be the same as the diagonal bimodule. It's just the sum of all flower chain groups of Li and Lj. But the differential is deformed. I deform the differential and I actually deform the product as well, but yeah. So, if you remember previously, this blue term was not here, right? So the deformation is introducing this new blue term and I will explain it, but if you put t equals zero here, then you will just recover the diagonal bimodule. And you are basically counting over the holomorphic two gons as before, but now you are somehow modifying like you are weighting every term here by this t to the t alpha partial h u term alpha sorry partial h u is the first homology class you see on the board it's like you consider this path that goes from x to y and you concatenate it with two fixed paths from the intersection points to a base point on m there is some choice involved here but i like thinking of this first homology class is the class of the pad from x to y but of course that's not really well defined and so this is the term that you deform your structure okay and you know to define a bi module you have to define how to you have to define the multiplication as well so the right multiplication is again defined similarly if you have you know if you ignore the blue term here, you get the same thing as before. Like you get the same multiplication as the diagonal bimodule, okay? But you are again counting over triangles with boundaries on X, Y, and Z. And this slide has to be corrected a little, but yeah, so this X and Y have to be, no, it doesn't actually, anyway. But now you weight the triangles, not only by T to the area, but also by a similar term here, t to the t times this thing here, the homology class, the first homology class from x to z with the base point here, so with the paths to the base point. 
there's a motivation, but yeah. Questions? Okay. Okay. So, yeah, as I said, if you plug t equals zero, this term will disappear, okay? And it gives the diagonal by module, as I said. So, here's the relation to symplectic geometry. This by module that I just defined corresponds to the action of phi to the phi alpha to the t whenever t is small. So this is something that follows from Fukuya's trick. It's, a, it's not hard actually, it's quite pretty, but I think it will take some time. Or actually maybe not. Um, questions so far, sorry, I didn't stop. Sorry, what, what does small mean? Small means it has, it's a real, t is a real number now. Yeah, small with respect to what? Small with respect to Euclidean norm. Okay, less than one is enough? No, 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 it's like there's, there exists an epsilon. Okay, so that epsilon, what does it depend on? That's my question. Depends on the Lagrangians, the symplectic manifold, the symplectic form. It depends on a lot of the data. It's basically, okay. maybe I should say in this way. Um, Sorry. Yeah, I think I will. Okay, I think I know how to do this now. And yeah, okay, let me. So, yeah, the, the trick here is, you know, it's something basic actually. You have this Lagrangian L here, right? And you have some other Lagrangians. And you are counting polygons like this or triangles. Maybe I shouldn't have drawn it this way, but anyway. So um, you have an isotopy of this Lagrangian, right? Generated by the symplectic isotopy. Now you can actually write a family of the pheomorphisms, okay? That identifies L with the image under this isotopy, but that fixes all, every, all other Lagrangians. And under this smooth isotopy, you can, you know, you can basically you can basically identify the polygons here, and there's an energy identity, so difference in energy. EU is somehow similar to. Okay, so this term that I wrote there. So you, you are basically, sorry, there's also T here. You're basically modifying, but as you can see here, you cannot do this for large T, right? Because, you know, for large T, the intersection pattern will change. There may be new polygons appearing or some polygons may just die. So that's okay. the, that's the reason you have this. Um, thank you. And yeah. New share. Share. Okay. And here's another statement. This family of bi modules behave like a local group action. In other words, for small t1 and t2, this convolution, which is the replacement for composition, is you know the bi module that corresponds to t1 tensor bit by module that corresponds to T2 gives you the by module corresponds to T1 plus T2. And a quick remark, this doesn't actually follow from the previous lemma. I will sketch a proof of this in a different setting. But again, this has the assumption that T1 and T2 have to be small for a different reason. Questions? Okay. Yeah, maybe I shouldn't. Yeah, okay. So there's a review slide here. I fix a prime larger than two. And 
ZP is just the completion of Z with respect to the periodic norm that I defined here, P to the minus wall PX. And QP, you can define it as the field of fractions of ZP. It's a norm field. You can do analytic geometry over QP. Okay, please don't judge me for the coming things. Um, so D1 is what I denote the closed unit disk by. So you can identify the QP points of D1 with ZP. Okay. So I just wrote this expression. I hope nobody will judge me for you know ignoring other points of the Berkowitz spectra or something like. That. Yeah, it's I, I don't really care about that much details and rigid analytic geometry. I, I don't think you, know, you have to know anything about it either for this talk at least. Okay, and doing analytic geometry means there has to be a ring of functions. This is what I denote by QPT. It's the set of series in T with coefficients in QP and co coefficients satisfy this convergence condition. You can think of this as analytic functions on D1. And you can similarly define smaller disks. So DP to the negative N is closed disk of reduced P to the negative N. You can identify some points of it with P to the N ZP. And you know the set of analytic functions on the smaller disk can be identified by replacing the variable T here by T over P to the N. So the reason I'm, yeah. So some funny features, okay, maybe you may not find this very strange. It's something that you see in the non-Archimedean setting, but okay, so the natural numbers actually belong to the unit disk. And unit disk is an additive group as well, right? In the complex setting, in, for complex unit disk, this is something that doesn't happen. And okay, there's something, that's specific to periodics, but not specific to periodics, of course, but you know, the natural numbers actually are dense in the unit disk. It's not only this, so it's not something that, yeah. So there's also a theorem, Strassmann's theorem, right? If you have an analytic function on D1 with infinitely many zeros, then the function itself is identically zero. And similarly, if you, have, if you consider the coherent sheets on the disks, they are locally free outside finitely many points. So I will actually use this feature towards the very end. Any questions? Okay. Yeah, maybe I'm re reviewing what you already know. Or, but no pressure, you can ask everything. Um, so I need a version of Pukai category over smaller fields and over QP. I should actually mention this is not something canonical. So it's somehow similar to the trick of, you know, if you have a complex affine variety, you can find, you know, a smaller subfield of C, a finitely generated subfield, finitely generated over Q, that involve all the coefficients that include all the coefficients defining the affine variety. So you can actually define the variety over some smaller subfield and you can then embed that subfield into QP. That's a trick that Bell, for instance, uses in his original paper. But anyway, so as I said, this assumption on the Lagrange, on the generators actually imply that uh, some here are finite sums. And okay, you can maybe ignore this bullet if you don't want. It's just you don't really need infinite series to define the Fukaya category. It's just, the, you know, the Novikov polynomials are enough. Like polynomials with real, ex, with, you know, real exponents are enough. And so these areas belong to some finitely generated subgroup of R that you see here, it's the omega m image of the second relative homology group of m with respect to all Lagrangians. If you remember, if you remember you had, you know, you had disks with bounds on those Lagrangians, so they define integral relative homology classes. And 
you just consider the area of them. So it's finitely generated. And you can actually extend this a little bit to another finitely generated group. And let's pick a basis of this other group G. Let's call them G1 dot 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 GK. And then the Foucault category is defined over this purely transcendental extension. Okay. So I denote this by QT to the G. And you, you define the Foucault category as Fm with coefficients in Qt to the g. And for any embedding of this guy here into Qp, you get a category over Qp. It's just base change. It's just extension of coefficients. Oops. So for a reason that you will see in the next slide, I am assuming that the periods of alpha, alpha image of the one, uh, one chains in M also fall into this finitely generated group G. Questions on this slide? Okay. So now we are about to define the local periodic action. Action again just means a periodic family of pi modules. Okay, so I replaced the previous formula. In the previous formula, if you remember, there was no mu here. I wish I, yeah. So mu is this embedding of the field of definition into QP, by the way. So I want to replace this formula by what you see on the board, what you see in the slide. So I just map this T to the energy term, term into QP and I map this term into QP as well and I take its T to power. Questions? No? So I didn't tell how to define this. So I want this to be an analytic function in T. And I'm assuming this guy is one mod P. I don't really, yeah, I, I, don't, I do need this, so. Well, almost. Um, I need to assume, you know, this term here, this T to the alpha partial HU to be one mod P. And the definition is due to Bjorn Poonen and Jason Bell. So if you have an element of, if you have an element of one plus PZP, then you can define its T to power as this infinite sum. T choose I times V minus one to the I. It's an analytic function. It's an analytic function in T. And since I am assuming V is one mod P, this actually converges. This is an infinite sum, but and it satisfies every nice property that you want. Like for instance, you know, if you replace T by a natural number here, then you get what you expect because of binomial theorem. And you can also choose this embedding into QP so that this term is one mod P. That's basically because you have a, you know, you have, a, you have a purely transcendental extension here that's generated by terms like this. And QP has lots of lots of elements of this form. Sorry. Yeah. Questions? No? Okay. I hope I'm not. Okay, so I will just define this family of pi modules. Very similar, sorry, in a way, very similar to the previously defined thing. Okay, so, you know, there's this QPT term here. It's because I want this to be a family of pi modules over the disk. And you can think of this guy as a, let's say, you know, this 
graded vector space at least is a vector bundle over the disk, over the periodic unit disk. And as, again, as before, it's just the span of intersection points of Li and Lj. And the proposition here is it also behaves like a local group action. Namely, if you tensor the family restricted to T1, so you just plug T1 here, T1 and T2 are elements of Zp. And if you tensor this family with the family, sorry, not family, this bimodule with the bimodule corresponding to T2, then you obtain the bimodule corresponding to T1 plus T2. As long as T1 and T2 are small. Questions? Have I lost everyone or maybe I haven't lost? Okay. No questions? Nobody's wondering why? Okay. I'm just moving then. Yeah. Um, so you define a map. So this is the idea of the proof of the proposition. As I said, a proposition of this form appeared before as well. And I told you that you know, this didn't really follow from the geometric statement I made. So you define a map from the left-hand side here to the right-hand side by sending M2 tensor M1 to the sum here. Okay, this is something very similar. I will just give you the meaning of the terms. I'm counting the triangles with corners on M1, M2, and Y. And now I modify, it's like I, this partial one U is this part of the boundary concatenated with fixed paths and same with partial two U. And I reweight every triangle with this term here, mu of T to the alpha partial one U to the T one. This is the periodic exponential that I just told you about. And same here, but you replace partial one with partial two and T one with T two. So, okay, if you plug T1 and T, T if, so if you plug T1 equals T2 equals zero, this is a standard quasi-isomorphism. If you have, for instance, if you consider an algebra and if you take the tensor product of the algebra with itself over the algebra itself, then the multiplication map just gives you an isomorphism to the algebra, right? It's like the diagonal tensor diagonal is the diagonal. And that's what happens that T1 equals T2 equals zero. But then it induces a quasi-isomorphism at a small neighborhood of zero, zero. That small now means periodically small. That's the idea of the proof. So, you know, it's just, I think, you know, these observations are you know, more to the point in a symplectic geometry seminar, maybe in an algebraic geometry seminar, people may find it offensive, I don't know. Uh, but you know, p to small is equivalent to being inside p to the n zp for a large n. So you can actually conclude that this identity holds for every pair of elements, for every pair of t1, t2, inside P to the N ZP. And you can combine this corollary with the quasi-isomorphism preserving proper, sorry, yeah, with the proper that the base change preserves quasi-isomorphisms. I'm black boxing a little here, but you know, if you remember, we had different families before. So we had different bimodules before. Those were bimodules over the Foucault category with Novikov coefficients. Okay, so you have this guy here and this guy here and you take their tensor product and it gives you what you expect. Namely, if you consider the bimodule for T1 and T2, then you get the bimodule for T1, T2 plus T2, sorry. 
And this holds as long as T1 and T2 both belong to the set of rational numbers with large periodic valuation. Questions? Okay. Yeah. Some people are trimming the grass. I hope the noise outside doesn't bother you, but. So this is something, okay, so I, I, maybe I should have explained this better, but if you remember this bimodule here corresponds to the action of the symplectic isotopy for small t. And the last corollary implies that the bimodule corresponds to the action of the symplectic isotopy for all t as long as t has small periodic valuation. Right? It's just because, you know. It's just because maybe I should, I should have written this down. Did I write this down? No, I didn't write this down. You know, it's just, mm, maybe I should just, okay. So. Yeah, so if you, for instance, if you, you know, if you have a large T, then you can divide it by a large number, right? To obtain some smaller numbers. So for instance, this thing corresponds to this thing by what we have told. And then you just do this. It's a funny trick here, but. So, And this is by definition phi t. This is not by definition empty, but this is empty by the corollary that I told you. Okay. And each time I do this, I somehow. Here's my slide. Okay. Um, yeah, and here's the proposition. Okay, this is a maybe more formal way of saying what I told you. So if you have a module corresponding to a Lagrangian, and if you tensor this with the bimodule for P to the NK, where K is an integer, you don't really confine yourself to this set, but anyway, I'm doing it anyways. Then you obtain the right module corresponding to phi to the P to the NK L prime. And you can tensor this with H upper L with this guy here on the right, right? If you tensor this on the right, you get what I've written, sorry, what I've written here, except for this cohomology part. And if you tensor this guy on the right with H upper L, then you get home L, this term here. And by definition, this is just the fuller homology group. Okay. So here's a quick observation. The rank here, sorry, the, the rank here is the same as the rank of this guy. It's again something that follows from the base change preserving, you know, so the base change and the field extensions preserve the rank. Okay, this is a sloppy way of saying this, but it's basically that. And this holds at t equals p to the nk, okay? The second guy here is a coherent sheaf over the periodic unit disk. And over the smaller disk, you know that the rank of this guy for, you know, for elements like this, recovers the rank of the fuller homology groups. Okay. So, as I said, you know, the rank of coherent sheaves are, let's say, 
constant with finite domain exceptions. So that's, yeah. That's telling you that this rank of the flow homology group is constant in K with finitely many possible exceptions. And you can replace L prime by something else. Okay, so this is something that runs, sir, you can replace L prime by, you know, phi to the L, phi to the I L prime, where I runs over the classes modular P to the N. And you can obtain the constancy of the rank of this other guy here. HF L phi to the P to the NK plus I. And this is constant in K with finite many possible exceptions. Okay. And that implies that this rank here is P to the N periodic, right? Because, you know, it's constant for every class mod p to the n with finite mean exceptions. So it's p to the n periodic. When, but you can also replace the prime by something else, by some other prime. And you obtain the p prime to the n prime periodic as well. And that is telling you that the rank of the Fuller homology group is constant in k with finite many possible exceptions. Because you know if you have something periodic with two different periods that are co-prime to each other, then, yeah, then the period can be reduced to one. Okay, I think that's the end of my talk. Thanks, thanks for listening. Thank you, Barish, um, for your nice talk. Uh, any questions, remarks? <laughs> Please unmute yourself and tell your question. Or remark. Okay. It seems no questions. But during the talk, you you had some of them. Um, and yeah. So then let's thank again to Burish. Uh, I 